Today, we're going to be looking at the Armoured Fighter, an amazing event coming up really soon, and also talking a little bit about Armoured Fighting in HEMA with my very special guest today, Toby Capwell. Here I am, everybody. <laughs> So hi folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiator, and my special guest today is Dr. Tobias Capwell, who has joined me because we're both involved with an event that's coming up in a month's time, which we're going to talk a bit about here, but we're also going to talk about armoured fighting a little bit in general as well, which might uh, provoke questions from you guys um, that we could address in future videos. But first up, so Toby, uh, what are you doing here today? Uh, what is the Armoured Fighter event? Uh, the Armored Fighter is basically an annual clinic, seminar, workshop, whatever you want to call it. It's a chance for people who want to fight uh, and train in full plate armor to do it really in what you might call the off season. There's a lot of uh, living history events and competition and, and things like that that run from, you know, really sort of Easter to October and nobody, ha you know, has trouble finding things to do. But I, I, I was aware for a while that in the winter, I still wanted to train. I still wanted to be getting in my armor and keeping myself fit and everything and, and getting together with people and talking about what we're going to do next year and whatever. And I just felt like we needed some events in this country that kept people who are interested in this sort of thing going through the through the off season, really. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So and so for anyone who doesn't know, Dr. Tobias Kapol is a um, arms and armor curator. He's an author. He's written tons of books um, on arms and armor. If you just type his name into Google, you'll find all of the things, many things over the years that he's been uh, been working on. And also he is a jouster um, and is involved in sort of the competitive jousting scene, a little bit of reenactment and also the HEMA scene as well. I'm sure most of you watching this channel know who I am, but I'm essentially primarily an unarmored HEMA instructor, but I dabble in the world of HEMA uh, in armored HEMA as well. Um, so I own some armor, not as good as Toby's, but we'll talk a bit about armor in a second. <laughs> and um, so, you know, there are lots of different people who own armor, who have these overlapping hobbies and interests and want to get together and use it. Um, so just briefly before we go into that, um, can you just tell us briefly about how did the armored fighter event uh, start who do you run it with and where does it happen and how can people watching get involved in it right yeah the whole idea was really growing out of conversations that i'd had with my longtime friend and collaborator dominic sewell who is the uk's foremost uh classical riding master uh he and i have been jousting together for nearly 25 years um, the two of us rode at the head of the reburial procession for Richard III in 2015. We've just been doing all kinds of things together for a long time. Um, for years, we were on the same jousting team and we comp competed in team jousts all over the world. Um, and, you know, we just we just work together, you know, and we, we have a similar attitude towards, you know, mounted combat fighting on foot in armor, all the sorts of things we do. And Dom runs Historic Equitation, which is his his riding school uh, near Kettering in Northamptonshire. And, uh, you know, that, you know, we're always thinking of what else can we be doing um, and what other angles are there for our work. And in uh, 2018, I think it was, might have been 2019. It was right before COVID, regardless. Uh, I attended an armored fighting uh, HEMA uh, workshop in Germany, the Harnischfechten seminar in Laukroden in, in uh, Thuringia uh, that's run by Arne Kutz, which lots of people probably already know, who lots of people already know. Um, and I went to that and I had never been to anything like that. I mean, for like 20 years, I had been focusing mainly on fighting on horseback, fighting you know, in tournaments and jousts and things like that. But I'd started to get back into more uh, martial arts combat on foot. Um, and and I went and Arna said, look, you got to come to this. And I said, I, I do what I'm told. So I went <laughs> and uh, and it was just a revelation. You know, I had never seen 40 guys in really good German Gothic armor all there with their axes ready to go. <laughs> and it was just like, where has this been all my life? <laughs> And, um, you know, I'm, you know, I, I have a, a sort of, uh, you know, a certain prominence in this community, but 
I don't, I'm not omnipresent or anything. I don't know everything about everything that's going on. And there's lots of stuff I've never seen. And I just thought, I just thought this is so amazing. It was like a whole world, new world uh, opened up to me. And, um, and I wanted more, you know, and and so I've I've gone back to the Harnish Vecton seminar since, of course, and done some other things with Arna more recently. We got a lot of work on together this year, um, but I thought this is what the UK needs. The UK needs a Harnish Vecton seminar, um, and then I and then I went back to conversations with Dom, and we talked some more about it, and he said, "Look, um, you know, we've got this, we've got this riding school." The in, beautiful indoor riding school that's that can be used for other things besides riding. It's a great indoor training arena where you can get 40 or 60 people in full plate armor and let them go. And it's got a safe surface to fall in. And it doesn't matter what the weather is. It just seemed great. But there was an, the, but the, it's like a confluence of all sorts of things that make something happen, you know, and kind of independently. Dom and I had also been thinking, what else can we do to encourage people and support people who are getting into mounted combat? You know, because riding a horse is one challenge, but then riding a horse in armor brings all sorts of other challenges mm -hmm. that, you know, you, you know, you can and you, you can get better at it faster if you've got people who are experienced and, you know, pointing out some basics to you. Get the right saddle. Make sure the saddle not only fits the horse, but fits the armor and fits you. And it's a, it's a whole system that has to work together. That sounds obvious, but it's not necessarily self-evident. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we had this separate idea to run something called the Armored Rider, which is all about, you know, you know, uh, supporting people who want to get into this. And also just just plain old armor coaching. People come in with their armor and they say, I'm having this problem or having that problem. I don't know what to do about this. And and we can, you know, sort of be the, um, you know, that, uh, you know, we, we can look at that and help people with their armors. And, and also, I'm always keen too to, um, uh, to always be working both practically and academically. You know, traditional academic scholarship has so much it can offer practical work and vice versa. So I thought, okay, even in a practical seminar like this, I can do some lectures. We can get other researchers in who are doing academic work on other things that are related to what practitioners are interested in. You know, my friend Ninja has been building arming doublets and doing a lot of research on that. Let's talk about arming doublets. It shouldn't be an afterthought when you've got your armor already, you know, mm. lots of stuff like that. So. And the other thing was we wanted to start advocating other periods too. You know, a lot of us are doing the 15th century and we yeah. want to keep that going and keep, you know, training in armor. But more of us were starting to get interested in the 13th century too. And we wanted to say, hey, look, let's do the 13th century at a higher level. This is a newer area that we've got to do the research. Who's doing this anyway? And how do we get everybody to talk to each other? There's cool people in Germany and the Netherlands and Italy and France and everywhere else doing this in isolation. Can Is, is there a role for our seminars, too, to just get people together? Mm. Um, so it all there's kind of a lot of different threads that came together. So currently... We run the Armored Rider in the autumn, and that's a mounted combat seminar. And, and then we run now the Armored Fighter in the late winter, early spring. And that was kind of a response to the first Armored Rider where we did it. And then loads of people said, great, but do you do, you do something for people who don't ride? And we thought, yeah, we, we should do that. I think it also is... Uh... A lot of these things happen at the time that's right for them to happen. And I think this event has really um, come at a time in the evolution of lots of different, well, lots of related activities, which in the past have been somewhat in silos and a little bit separate from each other. So, you know, I think a lot of the time, you know, there were jousters, there were reenactors, there were HEMA people. And these were sometimes completely separate people. They sometimes, you know, overlapped, but sometimes yeah. they didn't interact that much. But as time's gone by, HEMA's grown and got bigger. A lot of HEMA people have started to buy armor and started to want to do things in armor. A lot of jousters have started looking at foot foot combat side of things to create a more full, you know, tournament kind of um, uh, setting. And then 
I think a lot of reenactors, certainly since I was first involved in reenactment when I was a teenager, the historical accuracy, the quality of the armor, the fact that a lot of reenactors are now looking at HEMA or doing HEMA as well, it's just all becoming a lot more linked up. So I think it's really the yeah. right time yeah. for yeah. all of these yeah. armor owning people to to mm-hmm. do things. And of course, there's, as you say, there's the research side of things as well, you know. People like you, obviously, uh, armor research has come forward leaps and bounds. The research on the arming doublets, as you mentioned, underneath the clothing, obviously the fighting styles and stuff like that. So, a lot of different specialists coming together and communicating. I think it's a it's a it's a really great thing. Yeah, and it it seemed like there was all as you say, there's all these different communities doing kind of similar related things, but sometimes in different ways, but. You know what? What I see happening is that in all those groups, there are people who have the same priorities with people in other groups, but they haven't encountered each other because they're in different spheres. Mm. And I think a lot of this is also about finding people who have a have a shared ethic or you know some kind of shared approach or value to what they're doing and and they're they're in different communities because of their different experience they got introduced to it this way they've been doing that and they won't necessarily know that hey this these people in this community should really talk to these people in that community and it not it's not that everything is for everyone you know there's some people who just want to have nothing to do with that with that part of it and other people flow through it all um but it the, you know this kind of discourse I hope makes it more likely that the people who are thinking about the thing things in similar ways can get together more easily. Yeah, so so we're going to talk in a second about how people can get involved. There are some um, spaces left at the upcoming one, and obviously there'll be future years ones as well. We'll talk about them in a second, but just briefly before we do, so what's going to be at this next um, at this next one, which is coming up in March? Yeah, uh, this is the third uh, armored fighter. Um, that we've had. And the whole idea was every time let's again, encouraging cross fertilization and, and plurality and so forth. We invite different guest instructors um, to come in um, both from the UK and from the continent. Uh, And, uh, and this year it's being run by Matt Easton and, (laughs) uh, and, uh, and Gavin Locke, of course, as well. Yeah. One of my uh, one of my with. right hand men, yeah. So, <laughs> so so you're really the best person to tell us what's happening. <laughs> Indeed, yeah. <laughs> so that was a sort of loaded question because I knew it was going to come back to me. So uh, mm-hmm. you know, in a nutshell, you can you can read that if you're interested in coming, you can read the the program outline. Um, but in a nutshell, what we're trying to do this year. So the first year, um, we looked particularly. I looked at Polax, and then um, we had David Rawlings from London Longsword Academy there as well, looking at Polax. So there was a focus on Polax. In the second year, uh, Anna, I think. Predominantly Dominantly looks at longsword. Um, he did Polax and longsword. Polax yeah. and longsword, right? And, and, and the longsword was mainly half sorting techniques and yeah. things like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this year, I thought, well, let's do something completely different. So I'm bringing in uh, the kind of what I call forgotten weapons. Um, so the things which often get overlooked, I think, in armored fighting. And so spears, wrestling, dagger. Uh, and also we're looking at mismatched weapons as well, because the, I think there's a, a an over focus sometimes um, on polax versus polax, longsword versus longsword. So we're going to look at some, you know, mismatched weapons. What do you do if you've only got a dagger left in your hand and your opponent has a spear or a sword? What do you do if you've got a longsword and they've got a polax? Things like this. But then in addition to that, we're also going to look at some fundamentals um, to do with falling over and getting up. Um, and we're also going to have some really fun games. We're going to do some spear sparring in armor, both individual and in groups. So we're going to have some melee games, um, which obviously is a, a nice uh, crossover joining point between what we train in HEMA and what people might find useful for reenactment. Um and it's fun, you know, so we can yeah, actually yeah. get using our armor and uh, donking each other with with safe weapons and, and having some fun and also some exercise. And, you know, Toby mentioned something really important, which is those of us who don't put our armor on that many times a year. I might I might run two HEMA classes a, a week, but I don't put my armor on very often. So I need to I need mm-hmm. to remember all of the little, you know, get used to it, get used to the, the different center of gravity and. Um, 
build up my fitness levels. Gavin and I have started working on our cardio um, because uh, over Christmas we got somewhat unfit. So yeah, all of those sorts of things you've got to think about for fighting in armor and you get you get hot, you get out of breath and, uh, you know, getting up off the floor is very different to uh, when you're not wearing armor and things like this. So yeah, yeah super yeah. useful. Uh, so there we go. So how can people, if want to, people want to get involved, uh, we're going to put some links uh, down in the description down below. Uh, but fundamentally, who should they contact if they want to get involved with this one or they want to follow the you know social media and see the pictures and where should they yep. go? What should they do? Yep. Uh, well, I, I post as and when on social media, on Instagram and Facebook about it. When I am moved to think there's something about the next event that people need to know or might be interested in, uh, Dom does as well on uh, is his uh, historic equitation accounts. Um and uh, or you can just email them. We'll provide you know the details. Just just email uh, Emily at Historic Equitation. She runs the registration and provides you know whatever information people to need to know about accommodation locally and requirements and can I bring my three valets or whatever you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, so yeah, you just just get in touch with them. I mean we we have. Um, uh, a pretty good um, sign up so far for the for the next event, but there are some spaces left. So, you know, it's you know, if you think got to go to this, um, there's still time and, and you should get get in touch with historic equitation. Yeah. And for my part, I should say, you know, it's a lovely riding center. It's a really nice location. It's mm. it's quite rural and it's it's just a really nice way to spend a weekend hanging out with people who've got similar interests and lots to talk about. Um, and, you know, we have some lectures and some talks and, and it's just it's very nice socially. Um, as yeah. Well yeah. As the physical and, side. and it's a great area to see things as well. Mm. When we ran our last 13th century um uh, armored rider seminar we walked down the hill to the local church of Sudbury where they have a fabulous 13th century effigy of a knight there oh wow and we had a whole little mini session on that the last armored rider one we did we went you know just across the valley to Lowick where they have a fabulous early 15th century monument and a, and a late 15th century one so this is like you know we use everything that we've got at our disposal really Fantastic. Brilliant. Okay, before we wrap up, I've got a couple of questions um, I want to ask you, because whenever I have you on the channel, people always want more, more, more. They want more, Toby. They want you to have your own channel. Uh, they want more TV programs and more books from you. Uh, I know you're being squeezed like a sponge to try have people trying to get. Oh. But uh, two questions. I've, these are personal questions. Uh, give us an update on your armor. I think you're you're sporting a different armor now than yeah. last time I saw yeah. you. Uh, well, it's... the. I mean, you didn't see much armor from me the last time you were at the Armored Fighter because for the last couple of years it's been disassembled and and been and being rebuilt and changed around and and everything. So I've had an extended period of of futzing around with it. But this year, in, coming up, you know, just in March is is like the first year in ages where I've got you know fully functional armor that I'm you know that I'm going to get in and actually be able to participate in the in the proceedings and i'm looking you know forward to that uh since like uh yeah since 20 2018 i've been working on this innsbruck armor project where you know my one of my my favorite armors of all time which is in one of my favorite places in the world uh is the armor of gaudens von match uh who was a a Tyrolean nobleman in the late mid to late 15th century. He's famous as, you know, one of the generations of the, the match family who owned the castle of Kerberg uh, in what is now Northern Italy. And uh, you know, that's, that's like the Jerusalem for medieval yeah. armor lovers. It's this castle where all the armor survives, you know, since the, it's time of use. And, um, and that armor is just always spoken to me. I, it's one of the, the earliest armors I can remember looking at books as a kid that really made an impact on me. <laughs> um, and I've, I've sort of, and I tried to, I tried to reconstruct it or I took some inspiration from it um, when I built my, my second armor back in the late nineties. Uh, and I didn't really know what I was doing back then. And I, you know, I, I lost track of, of it, but then I've over time, I've, I've built like seven other armors and then I've come back to it. And I'm working on it again. It's an extraordinary armor because it's 
we know who it was made by. We know who it was made for. It's still in the original owner's house. And uh, wow. and all of the pieces are, you know, are, that are there on the armor are there for the same armor. It's totally homogeneous as it was worn by its original owner. It's covered in battle damage. Uh, Gaudens was the commander of the Imperial Army at the Battle of Caliano um, when Archduke Sigismund was fighting the Venetians. And that's also the famous battle where um, Roberto de San Severino, the, the Venetian commander, was shot, stabbed and drowned to death. Um, <laughs> and, and parts of his armor are now in Vienna. Um, but uh, but Gaudens' armor, as it is now, has the helmet, cuirass, uh, legs and shoulders. But there's some pieces missing, you know, obviously the arms mm -hmm. and the gauntlets. And that's always tantalizing to me when you have, you know, you have solid evidence, but then there are questions, there are missing pieces that you, you, you know, need to find answers to. Mm -hmm. And Innsbruck armor, the, the, the armor making center of Innsbruck is hugely important in the 16th century because that's where Maximilian founded his court workshop in the early 16th century. But the early history of Innsbruck from like the 1460s through to the, about 1490 is lesser known, but but very interesting to me. And um, they have a unique style that doesn't look like other German armor. It's very organic, very, very anatomically pure. It tries to follow the, the, the human anatomy without mechanizing it too much, without without introducing artificial mechanisms that don't exist on the human body mm -hmm. and visually as an artwork too they want to avoid artificial breaks in the body that don't exist you know when you have like you know you have a, a separate gauntlet there's a hard break visually in the middle of your forearm where the gauntlet stops and the armor begins and that's not what the human body looks like so innsbruck armorers are trying to find interesting ways of getting rid of that mechanizing of the human body and get back to something kind of purer and you know it's very it's very much in line with italian humanism and italian renaissance thought and the trites family who the, the workshop that built gaudenz's armor may have come from italy uh, mm -hmm. They may have been. They may have come from Trezzo near Milan, and then and then gone to Innsbruck to to build a new clients and find new work. You know who knows. So I then I then started with you know building Gaudenz's armor uh, as I thought it might have been when it was new, but then I started to see. I learned more about what was going on in Innsbruck at in the 1480s, and I thought, well, they they could be building this as well, and they could be building that, and they came up with that, and they. Then they went on to build this, and I realized that like we familiar with we're familiar with garnitures in the 16th century, you know, armors that come with all these extra pieces that match, so you can put a different helmet on for heavy jousting, or you can put a different shoulders on for foot combat, or you can put different leg pieces on for infantry fighting, or you know whatever. Yeah, that's that we think of that as a 16th century phenomenon, but what I realized was. All the thinking, all the technological development and the thought about more highly specialized armor for particular kinds of fighting, all of that was happening in Innsbruck in the 1480s. And I thought, mm. you know, I can actually use this armor to project to explore that and build a kind of proto garniture mm. to show how all of the technological development was in place. And then, you know, learn more about how our garnitures really came into being in the 16th century hmm. super cool i'm really looking forward to seeing it and um i saw bits of it i think before um yeah yeah and the mail it's not that finished you've been... have you still, still got gold mail I, i've still got gold mail yeah, yeah. <laughs> I <love> um, that. <laughs> i'm stuck with that now um but uh but i like it uh and um uh so yeah, I've still got a number of commissions going of new parts of this armor that are still coming in. Um, I'm doing a big joust in Switzerland later in the year, which requires a jousting helm. So I need to figure out a way of integrating that into the armor, looking at Innsbruck jousting helms, the 1480s. And you know what is the most appropriate thing for this armor? Um, there's another salad. There are ultimately three pairs of gauntlets uh, and, an, and an armet as well. Um, so there's, there's a lot going on and it won't be finished this year, but there will be a new, a new form of it that I'll be, that I'll, a couple of different forms of it that I'll be using this year. 
Well, it's great to always have new projects to, to get into and get excited about, isn't it? It keeps us um, getting up in the morning, I think. And yeah. uh, so finally, sort of on that topic, um, what other projects have you got upcoming? Um, are you writing? Are you yeah. lecturing? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I left the Wallace collection a year ago, so I've, I've, I've been a uh, master of my own ship for just over a year now. Um, there's been a lot of lecturing, both live lecturing and online. I've been running an online course for the Victoria and Albert Museum. Uh, I'm doing some work for the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, a bit of work for the Worcester Art Museum in Massachusetts, the former Higgins collection. Um, and I am I was writing one book. I had moved the one book on from my back burners onto my front burner. Uh, and then I realized that wasn't making a lot of difference and was taking up too much time for the amount of progress I was making. So I put that one on the back burner, and but I'm keeping it bubbling away. And then I've got another book that I'm starting to work on now. Uh, for a while, though, and one of my main projects is the revised and expanded edition of Claude Blair's European Armor, the seminal reference work that was mm. published in 1958. Yeah. And, and Claude, Claude had always intended to do a revised second edition. He was aware of how fast in the second half of the 20th century armor scholarship was developing, but he didn't get around to it in the 1960s. He didn't get around to it in the 1970s or 80s or 90s. And he called me up in about 2008 and, or nine and said, look, I'm never going to get to this. Why don't you do it? Um, so I, so I took that on board, but then I was working, I had a lot of other things going on and I was slaving away on the English night armor of the English night yeah. project. So I did some work on it initially in 2009, 10, but then I had to put it away for a while. And, um, and now I've come back to it and over the last year, I've been working really hard on it, but it's a profoundly time consuming and difficult project that really requires extended periods of really mm. focused attention and and um and, you know so it's tough i mean it's like the it's like the uh, the scholarly version of urban warfare this book basically because it contains so much dense information this is the earliest reference we have to a movable visor this is the earliest reference that we have to plate body armor this is the earliest reference this is the earliest depiction of this da -da 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 -da. Mm -hmm. and and you know you have to go through and ask yourself every sentence every paragraph yeah. is this still true yeah who's done more work on this oh stewart did an exhibition about this oh ralph's done a load of research on that and like the, you've got to take 75 years basically of new research and and figure out how to integrate it into claude's book without losing his voice and his structure and and his presence because i don't want it to be european armor by toby i want it to be european armor by claude revised and expanded and oh, right. worked on a bit by toby you know right and that's an important distinction um uh, i mean it's it's and like you say i mean i've i've got a few books on that i've been working on for years and it, the problem is the longer you take the more material comes to light and you know right. one of one of right. my books was almost ready to publish and then some new source material came along that was incredibly important to the and basically the whole thing needed to be <laughs> pulled apart yeah. and reconstructed so it's yeah, yeah. it's really yeah. difficult no. It is tough. So I'm working on that, but I have enough data now on how it's going and what my progress rate is, having worked on it pretty hard for a year, to know that I can't just keep working on that full time um, because it'll just it'll just take away from too many other things I want to do that have that have short term um, virtues and benefits. Um and just places I want to go and things I want to do while, you know, while I'm still capable of doing it. Um, yeah. I have, you know, I have another, another, you know, book on, on, on chivalry and knighthood that I want to write. Um, that's for a more general audience. And, you know, there's other things one wants to do, but, but European armor is very important to me. So I'll say it's on the back burner, but I've turned the heat up to max on the back burner with mm. that project now. Yeah, um, instead of having it sitting in the refrigerator, if if you'll go with me that far with the kitchen metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's fantastic. And I'm sure that there are uh, thousands of people watching who are waiting with bated breath for um, your next publication, whichever one that should be. But certainly an updated Claude Blair's uh, 
European album, which I have a first edition of here. Yeah, um, very nice. Uh, which, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, well, um, so viewers, first of all, about the event, the Armored Fighter, um, that's only in a month. Um, but yeah. whether you want to come or whether you want to follow it on socials or whatever, all of the links are down below in the description. Um, it's been great having Toby on the channel again. It's been a, too long, actually, uh, and we need to rectify that. Um, yeah. You know, if you're commenting underneath this video and you're a fan of the previous videos we've done in the past, both uh, at the Wallace Collection, but also we've done ones uh, at churches and things like that as well. Uh, maybe, you know, we've been talking about doing some uh, future collaborations. Are there particular things you would like uh, to see Toby talking about? Are there things you'd like to see us talking about together? Places you'd like us to go? The ideas are always, are always useful. So uh, if you get posting down in the comments, check out those links and um toby thanks for coming onto the channel all and right thanks for I, having me i will see you in a month um uh in armor and out of armor and uh, mm -hmm. yeah i'm really looking forward to it and uh yeah thank you toby thanks for watching right. check out those links Bye, and we'll see you soon cheers folks